Yeah, Swinger. Uh, Okay, the two-state system is the subject uh, for today. And you remember from the last lecture, there were three uh, different uh, two-state systems. The uh, Monia Maser is the one that we're kind of celebrating in memoriam. Uh, Charles Towns was the inventor, everyone says, of the laser. It was actually microwaves. Um, microwave amplification simulated emission and uh, that happened uh, in 1955 and used in using ammonia which is the uh, the uh, third case that's on the second screen here uh, and I might as well put it on the uh, first screen as well the uh, nitrogen up nitrogen down very crude quantum model, definitely quantum mechanics we're talking about here because we have a situation uh, where it's a non-classical molecule. It's a molecule whose nuclei don't really know where they are. In fact, they're both in two places at once in the ground state and most of the states that he worked with. So this is definitely a quantum two-state system. But the other uh, states that the other ones that I mentioned there can be either really um, I would say that the, that the first one that I uh, show on this uh, uh, triad here <clears throat> is the electron spin a half polarization and very much a quantum mechanical uh, uh, a system and the one that we're going to try to play a little bit today with the connection between a classical two-state uh, or of uh, the uh, double oscillators that we were uh, um, playing with in the last couple of lectures uh, have the same uh, mathematics if you uh, walk a narrow road as the uh, spin spinner mathematics which we're going to introduce today and then of course the most classical of these two um, examples is the uh, electromagnetic radiation polarization uh, who, who's uh, the theory uh, goes back to uh, 1862 or 1863 and the Stokes vector is something that's going to play a big role today uh, in our description of, of, of dynamics we'll call it the S vector and that will also stand for the spin vector uh, if you're doing uh, quantum mechanics so really one of the uh, things, and I'll just uh, back up briefly uh, here to the uh, introductory uh, 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 slide. The main thing that I want to get out of the way first is showing that the classical uh, two-state motion, a newton hook equation, Hooke's Law and Newton's acceleration uh, of uh, a two-dimensional real vector is quite analogous uh, to the quantum two-state motion given by the single derivative uh, times i of a complex wave function Schrodinger equation. A Schrodinger equation as I said at the end of, of the last lecture uh, is uh, as far as we can tell now valid all the way through relativistic mechanics and perhaps even uh, will still be true when we finally figure out how to get gravity uh, into uh, quantum mechanics. And this is going to be forced on us by some really high resolution experiments that are in the, in the making. So uh, I, I do want to get through that again uh, and do it in detail uh, first before we get too far into this because this will give us some clues on how to think about these spinner operators, how to um, rationalize the fact that all three of these are 
basis for quantum mechanics that's very clearly understood. And the group that we're working with now is not just C2. We're working with the entire U2 group uh, today. And this is a group not of order two, but in two elements. This has an infinite number of elements, and we'll see that infinity play a very big role. Uh, and so this is dimension two uh, uh, that we're working with here, uh, two complex dimensions uh, in general. So let's get started uh, with this, and as I say, <clears throat> Towns lived to be 99. He, this is a New York Times uh, paper coming out on January 29. That's coming up uh, here, but this is in 215. So uh, this is an amazing guy, and a lot of amazing guys working for him, too, I might add. This is not a one-man project by any means. And Robbie Ramsey and Schwinger are also trying to do uh, something like this, but they were doing it with proton spins. And, and uh, they're just a tiny bit, uh, as far as their experiment goes, behind what uh, Towns uh, managed to pull off. So anyway, uh, we're, we're going to take on, uh, eventually, this is the one that's the easiest to understand. As you can think of it classically, you're using the complex numbers now to just track the phase. And that's true, of course, for all the others. So, as I say, these are precisely mathematically analogous. And we need to see uh, the details of that analogy. So here we go. Uh, we start with the two-stage Schrodinger equation written out here uh, with a Hamiltonian that is Hermitian. And if it is Hermitian, it can only have four real parameters. Dr. Hutter, just have a, Dr. Hutter, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so we know that photon is a spin one particle. It has three states of polarization. Right. But when we do the analysis, we only take into account two states, either up or down. Or That's, right. So, That's right. so what happens to the third state? The third state gets crushed by the fact that there's no charge and it's divergence free. So it has to be a transverse wave. And this is only part of the story. This is a plane wave and we're looking at it head on. Now you start going into the depth uh, of, on the direction of the propagation, you got more states, a lot more. And really, we're going to show eventually that of course this one has lots of states besides the two. They stack up. And this is the way we're going to build up angular momentum theory of, by that analogy. So th this is really a simplified view that's totally classical. We track the, the, the trajectory of the electric vector as though it was a position. So uh, that, that's uh, uh, the idea here. And indeed, we use the same uh, sort of notation here uh, for the amplitudes of the Schrodinger equation. That's the other trick that we're uh, using in order to make this connection. Uh, this is a real part, and this is the imaginary part of, of psi 1. But I'm going to call it A1, and later that's going to be an operator that ladders us up the quantization of the two-state system and, and makes all the representations of U2. So that's going to happen, um, not today, uh, uh, we'll just nibble at that little idea, uh, but uh, very shortly we're going to do that. And so I have X1 plus IP1. In other words, I really mean the phaser. X, say, this way, and P1 uh, this way. And then I've got another phaser down here that's just like that. We've been showing our phasers when we show waves turned. So um, maybe don't let that confuse you. Now, what's interesting about this, this particular quantum mechanical problem, is that both the Hamiltonian, the driver, and the state that's being driven have four parameters each. There's four real numbers. If you want to say parameter, you mean a real number. Uh, four parameters here. It's four-dimensional. Right? And then this is kind of four-dimensional, too. It's got A, B, C, D. You have to have a real number on the diagonal to be Hermitian. And this has to be the complex conjugate of that in order to be Hermitian. So you end up with just four. Thumb's gone, <laughs> right? 
in both parameters for the Hamiltonian and the actual dynamic parameters of the phase space, phasers, two phasers of, of the wave function. Okay? So there's the quantum mechanics kind of summed up there. Separate real and imaginary parts, complex first order equation, and we're going to split it into pairs of real first order differential equations in order to make the connection. Because this one is all real to start with. All right? So th that's the, uh, the, 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 the step that we're going to take here. And so rewriting this thing as that way and then separating it so that we have an imaginary part and a real part up there. And those are separate equations which we uh, show right here. So there is the first derivative of the x. 1 and 2, and there's the first derivative of the P, 1 and 2, according to this. See, and this is a separation going on uh, in detail. So that's the deal. Now, what I'm going to do, instead of just going right for this thing, I'm going to make a Hamiltonian, classical Hamiltonian, designed to give this result, and this is it. It's kind of weird. Instead of being 1 half p squared over mass, I'm putting all of the parameters uh, on the outside here. I don't have any k in front of the x1 squared. Uh, and the same thing's true for p2 squared plus x2 squared. So those are the kinetic, uh, you might say, parts of the thing with the uh, uh, potential uh, x1 and x2 squared quadratic. And they have, of course, a constant too, uh, like this equation did. But here's the coupling. Coupling's weird. It's got both the x1, x2 that we're very used to having, uh, uh, this one, but it's got p1 and p2. So something's happened here to make it symmetric with respect to the momentum in space. And then there's this weird, weird, weird coupling that you do not have uh, here. That's actually angular momentum right there in the two-dimensional uh, oscillator model. Anyway, as I say, this is designed to give this result, which it does very nicely. Uh, if you get out your uh, Hamiltonian equations of motion and take the partial derivative with respect to P1 and with respect to X1 and then P2 and then with respect to X2 but with minus signs on, the, on that one, you then get X1 dot X2 dot P1 dot P2 dot and lo and behold, uh, they are the same uh, equations. Now, what we want to do to get this one is make it a second order equation. So what we have to do to do that is we have to take a derivative again of the x1 to get a double derivative of x1 and that comes out to be a bunch of single derivatives with the a, b and remember all of this stuff doesn't work unless we have constant parameters a, b, c, and d that is this is a Hamiltonian with constant numbers nobody's wiggling any of these things yet we do that much later so uh, that would be parametric amplification, which is what quantum mechanics is all about. That's where the action really is. But um, here's a double derivative of x2, and here's a double derivative of x1. Comes out to be a linear combination of x1 and x2, but it's also got that momentum in here. That's kind of weird. That's the C term, which this doesn't have. So the, the full story of this thing involves this C thing. We're going to play with that. It's really beautiful what it does and we'll give all kinds of funny names to it. So let me go ahead and pull this uh, up too so you can see it on this screen. But now the brightest screen is over here. We switched the projectors finally. So the dull one is way down there on our ter tertiary uh, uh, projector. So here we go uh, with these two. The idea is that I can get an equation that involves a second derivative of just the coordinates. And if c is 0, if I get rid of that c stuff, I can match this with the equation that we had for these two masses and the, and the three springs. Okay, and then not necessarily c2 symmetry of the kind we're used to. k1 and k2 aren't equal here anymore. So this is a little bit different from the b symmetry that we had in order to analyze this thing using cyclic group 2. But nevertheless, this is a set of four real parameters here. And here are four parameters, but they're, they're products of the A, B, C, and D of the Hamiltonian. So this is the connection right here. 
but it's only going to work for us if we get rid of this C, uh, this complex, uh, C for complex, I guess, uh, part of the Hamiltonian. If that's out of here, I'm good to make connection with Newton and uh, Robert Hooke, who just hated each other, but they're going to have to live together at this point. <laughs> okay? So, um, the uh, idea then is that we have a connection formula. And actually, we have this program in one of our apps so that you can put in the K12 and these guys right here and get the A, B, C, not the C, A, B, and D. It's kind of squirrely. True. But, uh, it, you know, Start. the connection is, uh, is still there. All right. So this is, this is just a, the uh, uh, separate. Now, I could figure all of this derivation here and just do it this way. The, the, in one line, I can show that this, the connection exists, okay? All I do is take the square root of this equation. Okay, now what I, that's what I'm doing here, you see. Uh, what, what I've got um, is the, uh, instead of this thing uh, squared, this A, B, D thing, that's this thing squared, okay, if I square it, this thing, if I square it, and then I of course have to square the other side of the Schrodinger equation, which is I times the partial with respect to T. So that's the deal. I start with, this is the operator time operator derivative, and this is a matrix that does it. I square that, I get I squared, which is minus, and then I get a double derivative squared, that's a second derivative, okay? And then I get a matrix with, with these uh, uh, a weird a squared plus b squared, b squared plus d squared, okay? So this is really a quick derivation of all of this stuff. That, but I wanted to make connection with the, with the um, Roman Catholic uh, canonical uh, classical mechanics, okay? I had to do that. The religion requires it. So uh, that, that's just, a, you know, m cement. But here I do it with just a square, okay? To square this thing and get that thing. All right? That's with a C equal to zero. Does it work with the C not equal to zero? Yes, it does. That's the, the, here's the complete story right here. Okay? I square this thing, and I got a connection, but this is garbage now. This is garbage, because this thing does not have a complex thing in. in order to get that in there, I've got to put a magnetic field or something in there. Then I would have a, a complex thing in the K. Okay? So, but quantum mechanics doesn't mind having complex things. We just say, here, here we go. Now we've got it. I squared with that C not equal to zero. Okay? All right. So that, that's the uh, thing that's happening here in all of this where we... Uh, worry about a connection between these two huge fields, and now we're going to make use of it. We're going to do something that involves U2. We're going to in introduce U2 as a set of parameters. Remember, it has four parameters, A, B, C, and D. What are those parameters of? Well, A is a parameter of a thing that would be called the elementary operator 1, 1. It's just a matrix that has a single 1. There's another one like it that's E22. I'm going to put those two together, half sum and half difference. There's the half sum, there's the half difference. Then the off other ones are easy. Okay? I'm going to have a B thing, that's the bilateral B symmetry that we uh, talked about when we did the uh, two uh, equal masses. Okay? Uh, with equal uh, spring frequencies, you know, and then there was a coupling between them. The coupling between them was determined by these two guys, diagonal components. Now, this one right here um, is the weird one, okay? So, I felt we had to have mnemonics, to, like uh, everything else I do. I uh, have terrible memory, so I've got to have ways to remember where everything is. And so, this this guy here stands for asymmetric. Well, actually, asymmetric diagonal. This has got the D. It's the half sum of the A and D. So this is asymmetric diagonal operator. This is Pauli's operator Z right here. So what we're doing here is we're 
doing the same thing we did when we did the C2 Hamiltonian is we've got a Hamiltonian as a linear combination of operators from the U2 group, actually it's a group algebra, this is part of its algebra, this is its generators. So uh, that's what we're doing here, we've got four generators of the uh, U2 group, three of them are really going to be important and active for us uh, in this stuff. This one is the one that you need if you're going to do some relativity. But if you're just doing non-relativistic quantum mechanics, this is all you need. This one called asymmetric diagonal, this one called bilateral balanced, that means C2 symmetry. If all that's all I have, then I don't need what we're going to talk about today. But then there are these other two symmetries, uh, symmetry operators, uh, that are going to come up here. Now, the C, C has lots of letters to go with it. Complex. It's going to give us circular polarization. It's going to give you chiral states. It's going to give us cyclotron motion. It's going to solve Coriolis problems and centrifugal problems. It's going to give us a curl when we study the field that goes with it. It's going to give circulating current carrying waves. How much more C do you need to remember this? <laughs> we are completely C'd out here. All right? And it's green, as in go, for a traffic light. So every time you see something that's green, that's the weird C coming in here. These guys make standing waves. These guys make circulating or moving waves, okay, roughly speaking. Okay, this one, standing waves, just stopped. And bilateral balance has got a little, little beat like it, uh, that, th that motion down there. So you got some slow uh, tunneling going on with this one in uh, the, the thing that's on the far screen there that we've been using for uh, three lectures now. Okay, so the question is, are there three C2 subgroups? And the answer is yes, uh, but there's a heck of a lot more. Here is the, the uh, C2B that we worked on, which had a perfect uh, uh, 45 degree line for the uh, ground lowest frequency mode and then another 45 minus 45 degree line for the highest frequency mode. That was our B symmetry. That's all we got out of, uh, of this. But there are these other th uh, two here. Okay? Uh, C2A. And then C2A and B combined. That's a, a, any angle. All right? But none of this involves this guy. None of these can go. They just sit there and sputter. Uh, this guy's got to go, okay? This one's got the moving weight. That's what we're going to uh, see at the very end of this thing, but mostly we'll work with these two uh, to start with, all right? Okay, so let's uh, see what it is that we really have to do in order to do quantum mechanics, and that is we have to be able to evaluate and solve, but most importantly, visualize all the sort of motion that you can get from a, well, it's basically a matrix exponent solution. That is, first order derivative of this is equal to a constant times the uh, dependent variable. That means the dependent variable is going to be an exponential with uh, that as an exponent. So I'm going to have the i uh, up here with a minus sign. That's what I get if I put the i over here. It'd be a minus i. So I got minus i h times time. So if this is the solution. This is the operator that's going to drive it through time. It's just an exponential of the Hamiltonian with a minus i and the factor time. And this is only going to work for h equal a constant. So if you're in there moving the parameters in that, that's a whole other problem. And the basic idea of an exponential of a matrix is what we need to solve here. We're not going to resort to projection solutions for this. We're going to try to get this the old-fashioned way. In any case, this exponent has the A type, which is commonly called Z, the B type, which is commonly called X, that's the X spinner, and the C type, which is the Y, the weird one. It's got an I and a minus I off diagonal. Okay, so those are the three things that are really here. And then this guy is just along for the ride. He gives an overall phase that we worry about only if you're doing quantum information theory really need it, but most of the time you can't observe it. So um, you got this uh, omega vector here that we have to uh, get in a, some good solid mathematical framework for uh, such a thing. And uh, 
That's really what we're doing here uh, when we write this thing. What we're doing is we're writing the exponent as a dot product of, and this is weird, do you see, this is really weird. This is an ordinary vector. This is the omega vector. This is the omega vector right here. Multiplied by time gives me a, 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 that vector right there in terms of those four parameters, okay? But the sigma, sigma is these matrices, these spinner matrices, okay? It's a vector of those matrices. Three of those things make a components of a vector uh, in this funny way of looking. So this is the weird part of getting into spinner analysis right away, is we have to define a thing like that and then give us a notation that sort of makes us understand it a little bit. So I factored out from the exponent here uh, this uh, overall phase, you see. It's sitting to the side of this uh, thing. It's a part of the story, but it's uh, a, a part that we won't have to worry about very much. All of the complicated stuff is going to occur between the A, Bs, and Cs. And our notation is really weird. We're going to write this as the omega component, whatever that omega vector is, of the sigma. I have to explain that a little bit. Uh, that's going to take up a little bit of time to get the algebra of that uh, uh, in, a, in, in a clear way. Okay, now I want this stuff to be really understood. So if there's some questions about what we're doing here, now is the time to start thinking about a, a, a question. Yes, uh, Lewis. Uh, so you just define the dot product algebra as a uh, mm -hmm. subscript? As a, as a, a triple, in this case, uh, we have only three dimensions, A, B, and C. So, uh, forgot about this one. It's out of here for, no, we're not doing relativity. We're just doing some stuff in space. And so I got a three-dimensional space here, A, B, and C, and I'm doing the sums over the three parameters that are here. That involve the four parameters that are over here. So that's just Einstein notation, that omega thing like that Omicron. Uh, that this guy right here, real number. This guy here, another real number. This guy, another real number. So these are all real numbers. They multiply complex things if they're the green. But the others are, are, are multiplying real things. The A and the B. The A and the B are ones that do things that we're pretty familiar with. C is the one that makes a, uh, a, a, real, a real picnic, I should say. It's the thing that makes things happen. So uh, this little guy right here is being written in a very reduced form. And then this is an even more reduced form right here. And we got to talk about that. That needs some talk. Okay? But that, that's implied that you're summing over those subscripts, right? Yes. I'm, that, I'm actually using a vector as a subscript to indicate that I'm taking that component. That we have to talk about. This needs talk. Okay? But anything else that you have a question about, let's go with it. And if, if you're reasonably clear what we've got here. Okay, let's go for it. This is where we really need to discuss what a spinner vector operator is and what does it do, okay? Then we got to take products of, of them, actually. Uh, I meant to put a B here, so we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, okay, so here's the deal. Symmetry relations uh, make these spinner matrices. Or, if you put an I on these things, you know what you should call them? They got another name. And this goes back to Hamilton again. Hamilton, in 1843, this is when this was discovered. I mean, these are Polly, Jordan, a bunch of other people, uh, spinners, okay. But that's in the 1900s. This is 1843 right here. Just put an I on them. Okay? Now, what's interesting about these things, and that's the first uh, 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 algebra table I'm, I'm putting down in the corner there, is you can look at these matrices uh, up close, and I'll do that uh, right here, and I'm going to catch up uh, with our stuff uh, over here while we're at it. There's a couple of products uh, that we're going to do to get this little uh, thing off. When I put the i in there, remember i is this crazy thing that's the square root of minus one, okay? And so what Hamilton was so excited about when he thought of the idea of having three numbers that squared up to minus one, he said, now I can generalize complex variables to three dimensions. It's been stuck 
in this two-dimensional complex plane, I'm going for a three-dimensional uh, quasi-complex plane. That was a big deal. He's so happy when he thought of the <laughs> idea that he carved the equations, the products of these things, uh, into a bridge. Uh, it was a wooden bridge, so he could carve into it. And he did that. Uh, he, put, he literally put his work on the, on the face of the bridge which is now in a museum in Dublin, you can see it, but for a long time it just sat out in the weather. All these years, they only started a museum a couple of, a, a, a few, 20 years ago is when they finally got, got the idea. But such an important thing. But what these guys square up to is not minus one. They don't have the eye on them. These guys square up to one. The diagonal of this table is one, one, one. So that, that, and I mean one ma unit matrix one, okay? So th that is uh, something that uh, is really very important here. And also, while we're at it, we're going to finish the rest of the table here. And, and we'll leave it down in the corner there. Here's the product of sigma x and sigma z. Turns out, and this is really important, when you turn these guys around, you get minus. They anti-commute. That's what it's called. And that's really important. Uh, what we're doing here is making something that has, we'll see, spin a half, and spin a half is associated with something that's anti-symmetric. So here are three uh, uh, products of different ones of these uh, A, B, and C, or to say it the old-fashioned way, Z, X, and Y. Okay. We're using the X and the, the standard notation for these things uh, right here. And then Hamilton called his things I, J, and K. More about that later. But anyway, here's the thing that I want to uh, look at. This thing is defined as a combination of the, some real numbers, the three components of a, let's say, unit vector so that a dot a has a little hat on it, which means that this is a number one uh, sum of the Pythagorean uh, squares uh, uh, in three dimensions. Well, uh, what I want to do, and this is where we really define the spinner vector operator, and then we uh, have the notation uh, 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 that we're going to be using up here, uh, uh, there, but let's just see if, if it really makes sense. Is this sigma sub a uh, like anything like sigma sub y, sigma sub x, sigma sub z? Is it anything like that? Uh, well, one of the things that should happen is it's just square to one. But this is how can that thing square to one unit operator? Okay, look at this thing. It's, it looks like sigma a squared. It's just a big mess. Okay, it, uh, well, it would help to sort the coefficients uh, out and put the operators that we know the products of uh, in there, okay, but still, it did, looks like a great big mess. This isn't going to, well, what, what are you talking about here? What's, what's going on? This is what was going through his head. He's carving that bridge. He knew he had to do this. And uh, sure enough, because of the anti commutation all of these uh, things that are off the diagonal of this table, you see, you have minus here, you have plus there, you have minus here, you have plus there, you have minus here, and you have plus there. They cancel out completely. We end up with the sum of the components squared, which is the number one, multiplying the matrix one. So you do get this thing to square to one, just like these do individually. That's really important. And so the answer to the question about uh, how many cyclic subgroups are there in there? There's a lot more than three. As I say, it's not a mess. This, it, it's, a, it's an unmess. It now means that there are infinite number of C2 subgroups in U2. That's big deal. Really big deal, this equation. So okay? As, as long as... As long as uh, the vector that you're multiplying is a unit vector. And as long as those form a group, you can use that table to, to work out those. To make this a group, 
I've got to uh, take uh, sigma x and put a minus sign on it, call it a group element number two. I got to do the same with this, another group element number two. And then I got to do the same thing with this one. Group and then I got to take the one and also put a minus on it. So I end up with four plus four is eight elements of a group that's called the quaternion group. What about the eyes? Well, the the uh, the the, the uh, uh, eyes come in uh, here if I use the quaternions as they are with the eyes attached. Then they go away. Then you get a, a multiplication of these things: i and minus i, j and minus j. K and minus K, and then also don't forget one and minus one. That's eight elements all together. When they get together, they just make the elements that we just named. So you really would have a group with that. But let me tell you something here. And this is another thing about the group and pest. The group and pest is a pest because if you just use the group, then you've got to fiddle with something that's eight by eight. Or sixteen by sixteen if you go further to the octonian or something. I mean, it, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. But if you play with the algebra, it's a little tiny thing like this. And that's what we did when we made the projection operators and all that kind of stuff. We fixed it, so group theory becomes algebra. And when you do that, it's smaller. So uh, that's just a little uh, advertisement for uh, what we're doing here. Uh, is, is making a, 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 an algebraic approach to all of this stuff as opposed to group theoretical approach. I don't know. Yes. So you said, so there are infinite number of C2A subgroups of U2. Yeah, there's um, an infinite okay. number of unit vectors in a three-dimensional and in a two-dimensional too, right? Okay. There's an infinite number of, of unit vectors that I can play with, and each one of them is a different C2. And they just form a group. Yeah. And, and they're, part, the identity. they're part of the group U2, which is we knew was infinite, right? This is a nice way to express it, physical way to express it. And we're going to see that because those vectors, that unit vector really is going to mean something to it. It's going to be either a spin or it's going to be a Hamiltonian crank. Yeah, because mathematically I just follow the four axioms and I just build up any arbitrary group. And I can use it Closure. Better. That's just a bunch yeah. of letters, but yeah. I was trying to say like the physical meaning of that. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the main the main thing that groups and algebra share is closure of multiplication. Yeah. They also have closure of addition and linear combination. So they're much more powerful. Group is so limited, right? You can just do products, right? Yeah. This lets you do uh, sums, linear combinations. That's what makes it powerful. And do it with less hardware. Okay, let's go. Um, let's look at a product of two of these guys, sigma sub a and sigma sub b. I've got two unit vectors, but they're different ones. And now is it going to cancel? How can that cancel? That can't cancel. Uh, that, that looks like it might be a big mess, a really big mess. I didn't bother to write that but you get the point, okay? So we write all those guys out and use the table for the uh, products. Well, you get a thing. That, uh, none of those go to zero. I think we got a mess here, but it isn't really a mess. The diagonal is the dot product multiplying the unit operator, okay? Then just below the uh, anti-diagonal, those two guys, that's something I recognize. That I recognize that as one component of the cross product. Okay? There's the other one, and there's the third one. So what this is giving us is this really nice relationship. It has both the Gibbs dot and the Gibbs cross product in it. Now this is the American guy. He goes over to Europe. You know, he's the bumpkin from this uh, uh, this horrible country that's that's just getting underway here and has starting to have some science. So Jai Will Gibbs goes to uh, Europe to learn some uh, physics. And where do you think he got his I, J, and K? Right from there. Except he just made them vectors, not operators. He figured that was too much for the Americans, I think. They, they, <laughs> they, they pull out their guns and shoot him, right? They did, did that. So he, he's, 
So I'll just make a, a, a vector calculus out of this and define the cross product. Right. Well, you see it. It's going to be pretty useful, that thing right there, that little uh, 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 ability uh, to get this. Now, recall, and this is something, uh, if you've taken my classes uh, in uh, the uh, first unit of the classical mechanics, we point out that if you take a complex conjugate of a complex number, A star, that means you write it that way, which means turn I to minus I, and then multiply those two together, you get a real part that's the dot product, only a two-dimensional one, and you get a, cr a cross product, but only one component of it, the, the super Z component that sticks out of the plane right there. That would be uh, this guy down here at the bottom, okay? So this is on the track to being that. This is just two-dimensional stuff, the complex variable, right? And that's what Hamilton knew. He knew this really cool. That's what it was, they were, everybody was being taught that, how, how amazing it was. You could do all of this field theory uh, by just finding the square root of minus one as a bookkeeping device. Uh, what a powerful thing. Well, it's a crazy thing, and that's what we need to do here after to derive the crazy thing theorem. I'm going to go through this very quickly, and you should probably read it on your own. But remember, when we make the quaternion group, okay, we take each of the elements that we have here, a 1, an i, and a j, and a k, and we put a minus sign on those to get eight things. But mainly there's four things to start with, and then we get another four if we multiply it out. Well, that's just the chain that you go through uh, uh, when you take an i to the zeroth power, or to the first power, or to the second power, or to the third power, and then the fourth power, you come back to one again. So this is a cyclic group right here, C4. Not something we're going to make a point of, but that's uh, what we've got with uh, these uh, 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 sigmas here. That's what we've got with that. That's the idea, is that i times a sigma, that's a quaternion, okay, a squared cube and fourth, by fourth it comes back to the unit matrix, and then you just start over again. So the fact that that happens, which is the same thing that happens here, means that I can get an exponential evaluated using uh, this little thing right here, i times the sigma, the original uh, Hamilton quaternion. If I use that original Hamilton quaternion in modern language, which is a little bit cumbersome, but there's all sorts of reasons for working with the sigmas as opposed to the i, j's, and k's. You have a lot more minus signs if you go with this route. But this route is very powerful because what it does is it takes a thing like this and turns it into a thing like that. Okay, that, that's the deal here. So let me catch up on the other screen there to this point where we uh, have uh, this thing evaluated. Now, here's what I uh, would like you to see. I'd like you to see that what we've really proved is the crazy thing theorem. That is, if you have a crazy thing whose square, if you multiply the crazy thing by the crazy thing, you get minus the whatever you call the unit. If that's true, then each of the crazy thing times a parameter, it could be a complex parameter, but let's just keep it real, it's going to give you a cosine times the unit, what you call a unit, and it's going to give you a crazy thing times the sine of that parameter. Cosine of the parameter, sine of the parameter. That's the crazy thing uh, theorem. Okay? And that's what we've got here. What we've got here is this or this. This is what Hamilton started with. This is what he ended with. Okay? Here the crazy thing is minus i. Now, plus i works too. Okay? They're both crazy things. Okay, but the minus is, uh, well, there are a lot of reasons for keeping that minus. Um, not the least of which is that we're talking about a phase space here, and that uh, has to go uh, uh, to the left, but uh, we'll get into that more later. Here, the crazy thing is minus i times uh, whatever component of sigma you want to work with. It doesn't matter. Just take your sigma and dot with some vector, some unit vector, and you're off to the races. You've got a, a, basically a solution to the evolution operator. You can write the evolution operator very elegantly uh, this way. Now you get an outside phase off. Sure, that's a little inelegant, but um, got to keep it because information science isn't going to live without, as Bala knows, this is a very important part of your, your profession, right? <laughs> you, we're trying to keep that over, overall phase from dying, which I'd love to do. Heartbeat wants to die. 
Okay, so this is a situation as we see it right now with the crazy thing uh, uh, theorem is that we can write our, our Hamiltonian very nicely as a cosine and sine uh, of the uh, parameter, uh, whatever that parameter might be. And uh, we're going to make use of that. But let's just add, use it to calculate a few things here. What I'm, what I'm telling you here is that e to the minus this crazy thing should be equal to a, 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 a cosine of the parameter multiplied by a 1. And then the crazy thing, that's minus i times this matrix, that's a sigma a matrix. The, the one that Pauli would call sigma z, so this is the one that he would start with, the word, uh, <clears throat> I think, and that's good reason to have letter A on it instead of Z. But anyway, the, the, the production that you get when you add this up is cosine minus i sine. So you just get the exponential, and then it's uh, with a plus sign instead of a minus sign down here. Okay. And uh, I just see I have a typo. This is supposed to be a plus. Please write that down. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, we have minus i times minus 1. That's a plus i. Okay, so there is a one that we could have gotten that without doing all of this. This is pretty obvious. It's a diagonal matrix, so uh, that makes sense. But the C, the C is a weird one. Let's go right for the crazy one, okay? It's, it's 0 minus i plus i and 0, okay? Then the, well, the, the minus sign outside here. Well, it's the unit again times the cosine. That's the crazy thing. Uh, there I'm starting off very nicely. And then you have to put the crazy thing in. Minus i times the uh, C matrix, the C a guy, this guy here, the curly centrifugal uh, chiral, rah, 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 everything we need to see. Sign of the uh, thing. There we see in the two dimensional space our friendly rotation matrix. Right there. Okay? Now there are lots of other ones, but here I'm just going to go for it and write the general formula for all possible rotations for any of choice of three parameters. That's really a, a point. And we're going to be very much interested in the polar coordinates associated with those three uh, uh, unit vector components. So uh, polar coordinates are going to play a big role uh, in our uh, analysis of this. But this is a general formula here uh, for uh, all of this stuff. And you'll see some of these formulas pasted on the wall uh, up here. Uh, for example, this one that we've just derived here can be written a number of different ways, but there are two of them uh, right there. And uh, uh, they use the polar coordinates uh, in order to do that uh, uh, there. So, um, th as I say, I have a bad memory, so I've got to put all this stuff up on the wall for me to look at, right? Okay, now, um, let's go ahead with this. Um, in particular, uh, we've got, as I say, uh, these uh, formulas uh, pretty well nailed. And um, one thing I want to do real fast is uh, go ahead and uh, use these operators on each other. This is what you do whenever you make a system that can do things. Uh, sometimes you want to ask, how, how do these things that do things do it to each other? I, w I would like to see what happens if I take, say, this matrix right here, which rotates around the z-axis, and uh, uh, this matrix, which rotates around the y-axis, and I use one of them on the other. I take th this guy and multiply him by uh, this, but how do I multiply? I don't just multiply. i got to multiply for and at. These are operators. So you've got to do an operator transformation uh, for these things. Okay? Now let's see... Um, as I say here, we have to rotate these guys. So, when we think of a generator, the, the particular generator goes with a particular choice uh, for the phi vector or the omega vector. They're the same. This is kind of like an angle that is gotten by an angular velocity times time. So, we, we, here's the frequencies. Those are what we really work with in physics. But if you're thinking group theory, you'd probably like to know what the actual angle of rotation is after a certain time. This is a thing that's a function of time. It's this thing here multiplied by time. Okay? This omega zero also gets multiplied by time. As I say, that's an overall phase we don't worry about. But what I'd like to look at is the C operator, which is a rotator, 
rotating uh, the A operator, which is just this kind of thing that's got a constant uh, a diagonal uh, with phases on it. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to actually transform. We're going to see that if I apply a Y rotation to something that's on the Z axis, that it actually rotates that thing uh, to the matrices that are the linear combinations now of the B or X and the uh, Z uh, here, but not a combination of, of this one. It's, it's going to stay in this plane here, this AB plane, when I uh, apply this rotation. Uh, 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 by, uh, and I'm going to do it with an angle of, uh, that has uh, this equal to um, uh, 30 degrees, I believe it is. Okay? So, I have to put the, this rotation uh, matrix, that's this one, here and apply it to A, but that just takes care of the bras of A. I've got to have something over here to take care of the kets. I'm sorry, this one, this one takes care of the kets that are in there. This one takes care of the bras. You've got to do both sides of an operator. Remember, it's like an operator is a ket-bra combination, so I can't just transform half of it. I've got to transform the other half, uh, and I have to do it with the uh, conjugate operator, the inverse operator to this one. This is all stuff that you, you, know, you learn in elementary matrix. Uh, uh, um, kind of, uh, analysis, okay? And then, once I do that, I get squares of the sines and cosines, but all of those uh, squares turn out to be just uh, cosine and sine of twice the angle. This is something that we really need to talk about. Uh, well, so we end up with, when we do this, where phi C is equal to 30 degrees, is we get a rotation of 60 degrees here, twice maybe what you would have expected. Okay, so the, the actual phi is 30, but we end up multiplying by an Euler angle, beta, that is two times of that 30 degrees, 60 degrees. So very important thing, when you're in the 3D ABC vector space, real vector space, things go twice as much. There's a factor two uh, involved. And vice versa, you uh, look at what's going on over in the spinner world, it's half as fast as what's going on in your vector world. Okay. So, these fore and aft transformations are doing what you might expect them to do. And here is the uh, angle as far as the, uh, uh, the spinner world is concerned. There's the frequency uh, vector right there. Either All of those things, when you put a little hat over this thing, you can use either one, you know, no matter what time it is. You see, because you've just calc you've just uh, taken the time part out uh, by this square root here, and then of course this one is constant. Those are actual uh, omegas that are just simply constants. Uh, these equations are equal, even though these uh, quantities by themselves, this one is a function of time, whereas this is constant. Okay, so far, have I said too much? Is there anything that's not making sense uh, about this? This is the hardest part of this lecture. It's downhill from here. So there would be a T at that fi on that final term that's chopped off? Chopped off of the screen? Are you... Are you the, the omega term would have a T in it to make it equal to an angle. No, and I'm glad you asked that. It's right as it's written because we're only interested in the hat. So no matter how big it is, I'm going to cancel that out. Okay? Gotcha. Does that, does everyone see that? You should have asked that question. Mm -hmm. This guy here is a constant. This guy, it's, this guy here is equal to that times t. But I'm going to divide by that. So this is equal to that. That's why the hat quantities you see are not functions of time, even if they're just angles. Very important little piece of <laughs> stuff that you've got to, you know, you got to see. Anything else that you can think of that might help us along? As I say, we're at the pinnacle now, or maybe you think of it as the uh, uh, guts of hell, <laughs> as far as algebra goes. But um, we're going to climb out or climb down uh, from here. Okay. So here's an actual picture of both of this. This is rotating B, and it rotates and makes it, the 
both of these vectors get rotated by 60 degrees by this thing that has only 30 degrees in it. Here's our connection between uh, the, um, the two worlds, okay, the spin one world and the spin half world. We're going to uh, now make the connection, show, show actual rotations that get, have these mysterious factors of two or a half, depending on which way you're going, uh, between the spinner world, it's a two-dimensional complex world, and the vector world is the one we live in, it's three real dimensions. Uh, uh, that we, our brains are wired for this one, we ain't wired for this one, okay? At least not entirely. So uh, we got a little bit of visualization work to do here. Uh, the prior two slides, a quick question, I'm sorry. To sure. Oh. This um, one? So, in a way what we're dealing with here when we're transforming the operator is, in essence, dressing states? Or addressing the operator. Uh, well, remember, uh, each of these operators is associated with a vector. It is the a component, okay? So that means it's the a axis component, or the b axis uh, component. Here, here's a b down here, which Pauli uh, would have called the x axis, and then mm -hmm. uh, we just talked about the a or the z axis, which you would have. Uh, we normally put that one last. And then the, this weird C axis, right? So at first you think there's only three kinds of C2 groups here. The ones associated with this, the B axis, the A axis, and the C axis. What's in between that? Any vector, any unit vector. See, so every one of these sigmas, this one, is associated with the unit phi vector or the unit omega vector. Either one of those are equal to each other. So each one of these has attached to it, a, is, is identified by a vector. Now that vector is the spin vector associated with that particular operator. And that's what we've got to get through our heads. That's what we've got to see now. See that uh, manifest. So that's a really important thing. Now later on there's going to be a uh, an operator vector called the crank that turns that spin around. That's what we're going for here. Yeah. Okay. Question, question's a little but the uh, the answer, and that's what I'm about to answer, is how does that spin operator actually become a physical spin that you work with? You see, this is where we break from the mathematicians and go and ask the question: What is a, a spin half vector? Okay. So, good question. I'm going to come Almost back to too this. good. Yeah, I'm going to come back to this. Cause yes, uh, let's come back to it right now. Okay, this is where it happens. Right here. Let me get this one up to speed as well. Okay, so right here is where I split this uh, combination. Remember, this is our trick. We take the Hamiltonian and we write it in terms of, count them, one, two, three, four different sigmas, A, B, and C, and while we're at it, we, I put this one first here, the one that we usually ignore, the one that has the unit operator, that just wiggles the overall phase, okay? But now I'm, I'm more like the information guys, I'm saying, hey, you know, I ought to put this one first, <laughs> and have those guys down there just be the noise, right? <laughs> but, of course, I'm interested in this as a molecular physicist. But, um, so, here's the deal here. This is the notation for the 2D complex spinner space. And there are the matrices that are 2 by 2, and there's some complex numbers in there. Right here, this darn C. All the rest of it's real. Okay? And there's the names for them. Yeah, so the, the equation we have here is basically that uh, is the famous theorem, right? Any 2 by 2 matrix can be expressed as a linear combination of the three poly matrices and the unit. unit matrix. And the unit counts as a poly matrix, so yeah. you really, you know, and if you're going to do relativity, you need the hell out of that one. That's yeah, the one that generates your relativity. Yeah. Okay? It does it in a very weird way, but it does do that. Okay? We're not going to worry about that now. So anyway, this is, a, this is as looked at uh, from the standpoint of a uh, person in the spinner space. Uh, the, an alien that has developed a brain for spinners as opposed to us who have developed a brain for 3D. Okay? 
So in order to get to 3D, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a half out of here and put a 2 here, okay? So I put a half here and then I multiply this by 2 so it's, it's equal, okay? There's A minus D over 2. There's A minus D over 2 just times this. This guy right here is something that uh, 3D people should know about. Because this is where the angular momentum emerges. The sigma is the spin operator. And you do the same for this one and for this one. Even this guy gets a half. Okay? So those are the SC, the SB, and the SA. And now we have a larger frequency, twice as large frequency. So I use the uppercase omega to indicate that these are the big ones. Right? Does that make sense? Now I can even do it here, but it's, it's it, you know, it's, it, it's gilding the lily. Okay? This is the guy we're interested in. It's big sigma dot s. We're not little omega dot s, but big omega dot s. Big s, but big, big s means it's half. This is where you actually say, my god, we've got a half a quanta here. This is where it happens, as best I can find. Okay, so uh, you see what we're doing. Switch one half factor from omega velocity to the s momentum, the spin, actual s vector, Stokes vector, but you know it as spin. Very few people have studied polarization theory from 1843 enough to know. Uh, that the Stokes vector is what we're really showing here if we're thinking about electromagnetic polarization. Okay? So these big S's are the Jordan angular momentum operators. They're often labeled because of Jordan's J as JX, JY, and JZ. Okay? So, you know, this is all stuff happening in early 1900s. And people were really surprised. They got used to quantum mechanics from Planck, but they didn't get used to having a half of the darn stuff. And uh, just about everything's made out of stuff that's only a half a quanta. So here's a notation for the actual uh, uh, the uh, time uh, evolution operator. Okay, and then that's what you would write if you're working in the spinner uh, land. And you, so the one half is over on this. Thing and not on this thing. Now I got to bring uh, it over uh, to, together. Here's what you have uh, for the um, same same deal. This is the evolution operator right here with its evolving phase. But that's the complete thing here, and it's involving these omegas over two. You see. But well, this is what we look at. This is physically what we're looking at here. We're looking at things that are beat frequencies. These are half the beat frequency. But in 3D land, you get the whole beat frequency. You get twice what's here. 2B, 2C, and A minus D. Not this little one halfy stuff here. Okay, so this is a notation for 3D vector space that goes with, and this is really a very important thing. These omegas here are the uh, things that are driving. This is the uh, evolution operator. This is the things that are out driving the spin vector that you see here. And this is an action expression here. This is the angular velocity. This is the momentum. This is the angular velocity for B. This is momentum and so on. So this is right here for us in three-dimensional vector space, uh, an expression of coordinate dot momentum. And here's the crank vector written out uh, for spinners. It's half as fast as this one, which is I'm gonna, well, we're going to work with in our uh, three-dimensional space. So th th this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. This is where um, we get to r realize that uh, we got to deal with half a quanta and the operators associated with anti-commuta. There's all kinds of, of, of various, stu still mysterious stuff uh, behind all of this, but uh, that's it. So let's get all of this stuff up to speed here on this board, and then we're going to actually use it uh, to uh, look at something that's really quite obvious. 
So um, I will put this one back at the um, at the mathematics uh, that we just did. The color isn't so good with that uh, projector. This one is a lot better. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead now and look at what spin up and spin down. That's what we uh, showed uh, maybe first on our uh, our little uh, picture of three two-stage systems. In the spinner space, one half as fast as the three D spin vectors go. These little spinners uh, don't spin so fast. They're slow. Okay. Why are they slow? This is really obvious when you th when you think about it. Here is the state spin up. And here in three dimensions is the spin vector telling us, yeah, that's spin up. Here is spin up. Pretty simple, right? Nobody could argue with that one, could they? But they do. It's going crazy is what it's going, right? As I start to rotate this thing with that C rotation, that's the rotation around Y, by the way. Here we're using X, Y, and C in there. There are places where you're used to it, okay? I am going to be using a matrix like this that I would derive from the matrix that I have here that only has half angles in it. That's our uh, little C operator right there that we derived by spinners. This is what we know does rotation in three dimensions. We'll derive that uh, just from that later by a different method. But the point is that as I uh, crank up here uh, to pi over 6, that's 30 degrees, this guy is already up to pi over 3, 60 degrees away from spin up. This guy is going twice as fast as this guy, and that's weird. And go ahead and take it to the bottom where I go uh, just 90 degrees here, and I have made spin down, right? This is the spin down state. We all learned that, right? But that ain't down. That's half down, right? This is down. So very obviously there's a ratio of 2 to 1 here. This has moved 180 degrees, whereas this has only moved 90 degrees. No question about that. Okay, does that make sense? And you can go ahead and go the rest of the way and uh, take your spin up here. Okay, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, take your, your <laughs> I was looking at, hey, that's up. No, it's down. That's down right there. That up is down. Okay, <laughs> that's what you get from you know, having 180 degrees. And take that on the next screen here and rotate uh, it, and finally you'll get over here, back on the axis of spin up, but you've got the wrong phase. It's minus. That's the screwy thing that we're going to have to fight with in another lecture, so many different ways. That is uh, really, really quite um, mind-blowing when you, when you express it this way. Okay, so let me put it over here, okay? We're only halfway home after a 360 degree rotation. This guy is home. He was down, he was down here and he got rotated another 180, he's back home. He's happy. This guy, he's miles from home. <laughs> Trying to call him up, hey mom, where am I? <laughs> right? It's going half as fast. You need to go 720 in order to get spinners back home. That is really something. All right. Well, uh, we've got enough time here, I think, to do one real quick problem with what we've learned so far. And it's a pretty important problem. This is the nuclear magnetic resonance dynamics. And all it amounts to is having a proton spin. There's a much faster thing of this. It's called ESR, right? Electron spin resonance, because an electron is a huge, huge magnetic moment compared to a proton. The, 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 it's one two thousandths of the electron a moment, actually one over uh, eight, 1836, 1836. That's the uh, ratio 
uh, of the mass of the proton to the mass of the electron. That's what determines gyromagnetic ratio. Okay? And it's very close to 6 pi to the fifth, by the way. And there was a guy that claimed by group theory he could derive the ratio of the moments of the electron and the proton. You ought to Google that. And he got 6 pi to the fifth by this really insane group theory. And they gave this lecture at Caltech. And Feynman came to the lecture and he just eviscerated the guy. Oh, said, that's the stupidest thing I ever saw, he said. And the guy just sort of He had also gotten the fine structure constant, right? Spike group. Really, what he had done is he just played with all of the, the numbers and just got the right ratio so he was close. <laughs> it's, it's six pi to the fifth is off in the, in the fourth figure. Fourth? Yeah, but three gold. 1830. So you just randomly played with numbers, with parameters? Yeah, Google, there's a whole article in physics that came out years after it happened. But finally people were saying, hey, you can do anything you want with a bunch of numbers. You just play with on a computer, putting them together in various combinations. You can make anything you want. That's basically what, except you didn't use a computer, you did it. You know, sitting in a Swiss chalet, so, you know, occasionally skiing, right? <laughs> But Feynman saw through it right away. Now, he could have, what if he'd been right and Feynman, he'd been a fool of himself, right? <laughs> I, I was saying, gee, this is really neat, group theory, wow, this is how it really works. And, but then I was, I couldn't figure out what the group theory was. And Feynman, he didn't tell, care about group theory, he just said, what's the, what's the physical reasoning for all this? And there wasn't any. But you didn't, you didn't sense the underlying group he was trying to exploit, right? It, it didn't, it didn't make it, sense. There it is. That's yeah, the it didn't make there. sense. Yeah, it absolutely didn't. It didn't even make mathematical sense as it turned out when looking at it. Yeah, it was, it's a very strange thing. Anyway, this right here, either ESR or NMR, involves precession of a spin. So what's the Hamiltonian? Hamiltonian is magnetic moment dot B. But the magnetic moment is a gyromagnetic ratio times sigma. So there's your Hamiltonian, gyromagnetic ratio uh, times all of the B components, X, Y, and Z. Now we're using not A, B, and C, okay? So there's your Hamiltonian. There's the asymmetric diagonal part. There's the bilateral balance. There's the chiral complex. Okay, we've got a vector that just depends on where the B is. That's kind of neat, right? This is really a hard classical problem. Quantum mechanics is the easiest thing in the world. This is what you do with the most elementary quantum mechanics, which is spinner mechanics. Bingo. You've got here, uh, this is for fermion spin, that omega is the GB field. What we call the crank uh, uh, frequency is GB. That's the resonant frequency of, a, of that spin. Okay. Round and round it goes. Put your magnetic field anywhere you want. That's this thing uh, right there. Okay. And the uh, thing that we get it, see, the question is, uh, how is a spin state or a spin vector fine? We're going to answer that. But right now, there's the spin vector whirling around at a frequency of omega, big omega. We're in three dimensions now, so we get to use uh, those uh, big quantities, and it's going twice as fast. Uh, as it would do in this same picture of it in spinner land, which I'm not bothering to draw. We're going to do that later on. Okay? So, we have something to do here, and that is, how is a spin state or spin vector really defined for a physicist who wants to know what are those three components in terms of something uh, that makes sense? And this particular thing that makes sense are Euler angles. Euler angles are the angles on this gadget that's sitting right here on the desk. And uh, the Euler angle alpha is the lowest protractor there. The Euler angle beta is the one that's looking at you right there. That's the polar angle right there. Okay. And then we got a third angle, and that's uh, the uh, gamma, which uh, uh, nicely uh, matches with the word gauge, or overall frequency phase, overall phase is that angle, okay? Sometimes called the Berry phase. And Berry was very excited about this little gadget when he came to Georgia Tech to visit and saw it. He almost missed a whole bunch of visits just playing with it. 
So we're going to make use of that guy. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead on both these screens here uh, to a point, uh, and you can see on that screen it's showing a very ugly picture. So is that one pretty ugly. I suppose I should get busy and replace that. That's an attempt to photograph this thing. Uh, we should use a modern cell phone instead of an old-fashioned uh, thing. Most people know Euler angles by uh, what astronomers uh, picture it. And the thing about the way the astronomers picture it is they're always interested in the ascending and the descending nodes. So the angles uh, to the nodes are what they uh, work with. Uh, physicists are more interested in where the z-axis is, and that, of course, for uh, most of the uh, orbits, uh, there's nothing at the uh, perpendicular to an orbit, but in this stuff we do, that's where the spin vector or angular momentum vector or whatever is going to be, in this case, the spin vector. The spin vector is a vector inside this little ball here pointing at the North Pole from the gamma uh, dial axis. And that's uh, what we need. Now, here's how you use Euler angles. This is something that's uh, really important. Now we really are working in spin one, three-dimensional real vector uh, uh, space here. We're <clears throat> having this uh, thing start out at all the angles set to zero. And the first thing I set is the gauge, the gamma angle, the little twist uh, that this thing has uh, in its phase. Uh, you can't even hardly see that it's happened unless you're looking closely. And then, after that's done, I come down and I use a Y rotation to set the beta, a beta dial, this number right here. And once I've done that, and this is something you can play with, once I've done that, then I'm free to set this dial. I can't do that at first or I'll mess everything up. So this order is important. The third rotation is another Z rotation, just like this one, except that now it sets the alpha dial. Here it sets the gamma dial. We're assuming that the re resistance here isn't enough to make the alpha dial move. Okay? Well, that's what it looks like if you use 3x3 three three matrices. And when you're done with that, you get to see polar coordinates of the Z vector. And the Z vector is the spin vector. So those are the uh, actual polar coordinates of the Z vector, which is the vector that points along this axis out the North Pole of the uh, globe. And while you're at it, you're also doing a little bit of rotational relativity. You will notice that the original Z axis, which is the laboratory Z axis, is a polar coordinate expression for people riding on that uh, a globe. Okay, So this is the body frame polar coordinates <coughs> if you were on there. The only difference is they really are the same as the alpha, beta, and gamma, except that this one is gamma here, here, and no gamma there, and no alpha there. You see it's the same expression, but with all the Euler angles negative. If all the Euler angles turn negative, this quantity here turns negative. This quantity does not turn negative because there's two signs. And this one doesn't either because it's a cosine. So only one of them changes sign, but aside from that, it's the same as this, viewed relative to the body as opposed to the lab. We'll make big points about that later on. So just to give you a, a, a quick feel here, um, <clears throat> what we're going to be uh, doing uh, is working with, this is the thing that has the spin vector in, sitting right there, and it can be uh, all sorts of different places to, for different states. We need a crank. That's the Hamiltonian right there. That's the other vector that plays a role in this business of um, dynamics of spin. Uh, so I make that real small here. The polar coordinates for this are these angles here. First of all, if I write the x, y, and z of the omega, or uh, I can do it for the angle too, which is omega times time, but these are all units, you see. They're all units right uh, here. Uh, uh, and so this would be a unit vector. Well, yes, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a, a polar coordinate unit vector, just like the alpha and beta of, of, of vector that we uh, looked at for the spin. This is the crank. The spin is over uh, hiding behind there. Uh, 
uh, on the axis inside there, about there, okay? And this angle right here is really the polar angle of the crank. And I use an italic theta for it. And then I use an italic lowercase phi uh, for the uh, azimuthal angle, which is how much this crank had to be uh, positioned in order to get the operation that I'm interested in. Once I set it, then the crank turn angle uh, is this guy right here. That's the uh, thing that we'll be manipulating when we study uh, this in a little bit more detail later on. But today, uh, we don't have uh, but another 15 or so minutes uh, to play with this, so we've got some things to do that we'll take care of by animations. Okay, so are there any questions about uh, what's going on with, uh, first of all, the alpha, beta, gammas that describe the victim here, the spin, the actual spin vector gets whirled around by a Hamiltonian that is a crank vector uh, that rotates it. Uh, and uh, rotates at a constant rate, at a constant uh, position of the crank. Uh, no, those are uh, not uh, uh, variables that are functions of time. But everything else on that uh, globe is definitely a complicated function of time, as we'll see. Okay? So, uh, let's take a quick look here at um, how we would describe uh, the, uh, the spin uh, thing. And I'm going to, first of all, move this one forward to that uh, thing. And then I'm going to take this one back to where we did it for uh, three dimensions. Okay? So once again, first rotation is that ball, I'm going to grab it by the tip of the spin vector there and turn it by some angle gamma that sets the phase. Okay? And you can see that's what it's going to be because these three operators are going to start out on spin up. And spin up is just a number and a zero in the spinner. So this is the phase. We can throw this stuff out. Anything that's on this side of the matrix and this included, I can throw that out. I'm only interested in the components uh, that I'm going to get from projecting off of that uh, spin up uh, vector there. Okay? So I apply this, that just immediately comes outside of the thing, and then this is what determines the actual physical behavior. This is the population angle depending on what fraction of spin up and spin down you have. The excitation angle you might call it, beta. Okay? And that's what you get by uh, adding these two together. So this is a picture of the whole matrix, but this is really what you should be looking at right here. That, that uh, minus gamma, uh, <clears throat> you can see I've got a minus gamma here and I've got a minus gamma here. So that factor just moves outside, just like I said. That's the only thing uh, that the phase can give us. And then these complex numbers, the actual phasers, the actual phasers of the two-state system are being set by this complex number and this one, respectively, for uh, the, uh, the spin-up component and the spin-down components. Complex numbers are being set. Okay? And so the result, as it turns out, uh, and you can see that pretty easily uh, when you look at the real parts of this, this is a cosine of alpha over 2, cosine of beta over 2 is the sine of alpha, I'm taking a real part again, uh, to, uh, to sine of beta uh, there. So uh, th those are the actual uh, numbers that show up in this thing. And one of the ways to prove that is to actually take the expectation value using those amplitudes, those amplitudes, take the expectation value of sigma a, that's going to give you a number I call the asymmetry. This one's going to give you a number I call the balance. And this one's going to give you a number I call the chirality. So th that's some important physics and geometry and whatever you want to call it uh, uh, there. But the uh, uh, answers are really very simple. It's the three polar coordinates with an intensity uh, that's uh, one half of the um, total intensity, that's the actual factor that sits on the uh, polar coordinates. So there's a spin vector with polar coordinates alpha and beta. 
So the first two Euler angles determine the polar coordinates of the victim of the whatever field is providing a crank to drive that victim. And that's the whole story that we're trying to get across here today, is that dynamics and that piece of mathematics right there that lets us uh, play with these things as um, really visual tools. We can visualize this thing in three dimensions, which is what our brains are good at. We're very poor in the four dimensions that are here. But we can get better. That's, uh, of course, one of the uh, things we'll talk about next time. Uh, but this is the setup. Now, just to, to, to uh, stop for a minute and say what we've got here is if you're just doing the two-dimensional orbits that we did with the uh, C2B symmetry, right? you plot some nice trajectories, right? And most of the time, um, you might see uh, an ellipse, for example, a polarization ellipse. And that's if I was thinking polarization instead of orbits in a two-dimensional real space. But this real spinner space picture is useful even uh, when you're doing it with all four in a, a serious way. But this, with all four, is the complete description. That has all four parameters. And those parameters are alpha, beta, gamma, and intensity. Those are the four parameters that, uh, that we're playing with uh, with this, uh, with this uh, spin vector here. And uh, here is the three-dimensional picture. This is real. So you can live in a real space and tell what all of this complicated stuff is doing. Or you can take a look at just sort of half of it to see an orbit uh, over here, just using the real part, the real part, x1 and x2, of this complex vector, these amplitude uh, vectors, a1 and a2. So, if that's the case, then this type of quantum mechanics is totally classical. This is a Hamiltonian system. When it becomes quantum mechanical is when I do second quantization and I treat this A1 and this A2 as a creation operator 1 and a creation operator 2. And then I take the two-dimensional oscillator and not just show the fundamental, I go right on and up the scale of angular momentum from 1 half to 1 to 3 halves to 2 to 5 halves to 3 and so on all the way up to angular momentum 88 which is the angular momentum we showed very first slide of our, anger, our, of our SF6 uh, molecule. Okay? So that's where we're headed, just to give you a feeling of where this is going. But here we are at the rock bottom SU2, the smallest unitary group uh, there is. And that's the smallest symmetry group or spectrum generating group uh, that we have. Okay, let's play with this. We've got about 10 minutes here. Uh, let's play with this. We've re related these two sides, so it's time to actually see it in action. Uh, literally in action, because that's what you have here, is you have um, <clears throat> the uh, A, D, B, and C of the omega vector, the crank vector. Now, if you're interested in density matrix uh, stuff, and I'm going to maybe do that, maybe not, uh, we'll vote on it. But the density matrix is just S dot sigma with a little uh, thing that describes the intensity, the unit operator. So this is part of an, another lecture in which we do that. We're not doing here. Basically, the density matrix is the three-dimensional uh, expression of, of, of the uh, thing that we're seeing here, one, two, three dimension. Then the overall phase is just on the side. OK, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a system that's really simple, the A-type motion. A-type motion is when I only have the A, uh, ma the A matrix uh, going. Well, we'll make A and D just to have two parameters to play with. Okay, so we're going to have A minus D over 2. We're just going to have this component, A minus D, driving the three-dimensional motion. Half of that, half of that frequency uh, is going to be the spinner uh, frequency, the spin, what the spin uh, will look like uh, it's doing. 
So uh, we're going to have animations of this uh, very shortly here. And we'll do it for B and C as well. But let's get the easy one out of the way first. We did, we did B first B, uh, when we uh, started this business here. But this is really simple. This is where this is uh, x-axis is already a normal coordinate. The slow one is going to be here. Not at 45 degrees, which is what the B has, but right on the axis. And then the uh, faster one is going to be the Y coordinate, okay? What we call X and Y, if we, we don't call it, we call this one X1 and this one X2. The letter, uh, letters X, Y, and Z are the X, Y, and Z is B, C for Y, and A for Z, okay? So I don't use X and Ys when I'm in spinner space. But this is spin up axis, and this is spin down axis, if you're really thinking about uh, spins, okay? So what we're going to see is a trajectory uh, uh, in those uh, places, in this, in this uh, spinner space. This is a two-dimensional complex space. Meanwhile, out in the three-dimensional world, we're going to have a crank omega right on the A axis. And that means that this state right here will be the only thing you see if I put the crank right on that axis. So all I'll get is an oscillation like that. Or if I turn the crank completely over to the other side of the axis, all I'll get is motion there. So you see these little mini diagrams showing what the spinner uh, motion is, a corresponding, corresponding so all of the different possible S vectors, okay? Those spinner operator vectors, okay? There are an infinite number of them on this globe, right? We're just picking out one here. There's another one there. We're going to look at those first. But if you're out here in the middle somewhere, that's always a possibility. Very probable uh, if it's a physics, real physics problem, okay? So. This is just a little picture of the level diagram here. The omega over 2, that 1 half, that's how much above the omega 0 you go. And omega a over 2 also is how much you go below. But the sum of them is twice that. That's the beat frequency that's associated with the transition that would go on for this system. That would be actual transition frequency you could measure experimentally. All right. Are you ready to play this thing? And let's go ahead and go ahead on this one to the point where we can look at the various uh, pieces of it in uh, static uh, uh, pictures. We're going to get a picture that looks something like this, okay? Which is something like now, this. Now, this matches this drawing, and then the next page, that scenario matches that drawing. Good, good. And, and that's the thing, you can easily play with uh, those parameters uh, on the animation. So let's just go ahead and run this one, because this is the one that's going to actually move. And uh, I'll click it here and hope that I'm uh, home for it. Yes, there we go. Okay? So what this one is doing is, this is a halfway point. Let's go immediately here to the x-axis and click there. Try to get it right in the, on the axis. This is when the spin vector is lined up with the crank vector. What happens? Only this uh, component moves. That's all that happens. Only the X component moves, right? So the other one's dead. Well, I didn't quite get it on the axis, so it's got a little bit of vibration. See it? Right? At its frequency, okay, which is a little different from this frequency. Okay? And then the other possibility is I, I put this thing right, I'll try to really get it on the axis. There we go. And it's still vibrating a little bit, but now it's this one that does all the stuff, right? And it's got its frequency, which is a little different from this one's frequency, right? So when you, and let's go ahead and erase the paths, okay? Reset. 
Let's try something at 45 degrees, roughly. Well, they're different frequencies, so you're going to get a, a, a trajectory that covers uh, the available uh, coordinate space. So, Dr. Hutter, when you say 45, you mean initially you orient the vector at 45, at t equals 0. In the spinner. This is the spinner of space, right? That's the vector space, right? And there's your omega cranking the s vector pretty much in the equator, right? It's very close to the equator, the spin vector is, right? And obviously It'll I can, you know, come, come a little closer to it in the back side, right? Mm -hmm. Or I can come a little closer on the spin up side. So now it's making a circle uh, around the front. Or I can get real close, where's my cursor? I can get real close and be say right about there and make a trajectory that uh, is close to the north pole of the uh, three-dimensional space. Right? So are, are the contours in the background just the contours of a paraboloid? The contours in the yes. back, are you talking about this one or that one? Either one. The contour, oh I think contours you're referring to are completely covered there. The contours that you're referring to this yes. are the potential equal potential of the two-dimensional system that this is uh, the oscillator. Yes, and are those paraboloids? They're ellipsoid, ellipse, just el ellipses. They're, what they are is the V equals one-half K1 times X1 squared plus one-half K2 X2 squared. That's the, the potential uh, of the two-dimensional oscillator, right? With no f C, that's, just this, that's a parabola, isn't it? Well, it would be a parabola if you plotted that thing out of the screen, yeah, right? That's how I was. These are like the contours that you make on your models, yeah, right? Really. Which are sections of the parabolas. No, because my contours have higher powers. Starting with harmonic, right? <laughs> starting, with harmonic. yeah, starting from harmonic. That's what this is. This is totally harmonic. We'll talk later about what happens when you do screw around with higher powers. That's a whole another story.